Japan defeated, General of the Army Douglas MacArthur, as Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, had the heavy responsibility of transforming that nation into a peaceful, stable democracy, despite a tense and critical Far Eastern situation. The attempt to establish a wholly new concept of national life in a land which has been bound for centuries by rigid autocratic traditions constitutes an experiment unique in world history. On September 2, 1945, when the instrument of surrender was signed aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay and General MacArthur took charge of the occupation, it was already evident that the task of democratizing Japan would require an enormous expenditure of effort and money. Though more than 50% of the homes in major cities had been destroyed and an estimated 900,000 had been killed in bombing raids, the Japanese people, hopeful for relief from the rigors of war, willingly cooperated with their conquerors. Among the first jobs was cleaning away the wreckage of Japanese heavy industry most of which was left in ruins. And what remained of Japan's once powerful military machine was cut up for scrap. As soon as the evidence against them had been compiled, Japan's war criminals were brought to trial. Number one on the list was the notorious wartime premier, General Hideki Tojo, who assumed official responsibility for the conduct of the war and did everything possible to exonerate his emperor. Until the surrender, Emperor Hirohito in the eyes of the Japanese people was a god, the living descendant of the sun goddess, who created heaven and earth. Realizing that emperor worship had been the basis for Japanese unity and discipline, the victors elected to retain Hirohito as a symbol of the state. upon MacArthur's suggestion, Hirohito denied his divinity, his subjects nevertheless still respect him and even seem to prefer him in the role of an ordinary mortal. Hirohito found his routine in marked contrast to his former splendor. A prosaic little man, he lives quietly with his wife and two young sons, Masahito and Crown Prince Akahito. When not called upon to fulfill public engagements, Hirohito spends much of his time on his favorite hobby, studying marine biology. He has become an international authority on the mollusks and seaweed of Sagami Bay. Meanwhile, the destiny of the Japanese nation was being shaped by General MacArthur, whose public appearances were limited to official functions of major importance. He accepted invitations only on the rarest occasions, usually devoting seven days a week to his job as Supreme Commander. For the most part, the General left the social amenities to Mrs. MacArthur. The Allied Council for Japan made up of representatives of the U.S., the British Commonwealth, China, and the Soviet Union, theoretically advised General MacArthur in formulating on-the-spot occupation policy. But the meetings of the Allied Council were notably brief and perfunctory. Day-to-day -day decisions almost invariably were made by MacArthur, acknowledged boss of the occupation. Chief of MacArthur's government section, Brigadier General Courtney Whitney, had the job of keeping in close contact with Japanese leaders. The occupation's biggest task has been to encourage the Japanese to govern themselves in accordance with their new constitution. Approved by MacArthur and adopted by the Diet, it became effective in May 1947, defining, among other things, Hirohito's role as a democratic constitutional monarch.
民主主義に基づく文化国家建設の目的に向かって、私たちは着々歩みを進めています。In an effort to bring some comprehension of democracy to the Japanese, MacArthur sent out through the country 57 teams of instructors. But though eager to comply, the suggestible Japanese found the real meaning of democracy elusive and to them almost incomprehensible. The real meaning of democracy is to be able to explain it simply as a person who is not a person. The new constitution is The new constitution brought a radical change in the status of Japanese women. No longer trailing along behind their husbands in public, no longer inferiors, but sharing equal rights with men, women organized clubs to discuss their newly found freedom and to take an active role in civic affairs. Under the new democracy, there emerged the office seeker. Whose only hope of getting elected lay in having an appealing program which could win the support of his constituents. Rubber stamp office holders, answerable only to the throne, were gone. In their places stood new westernized politicians, complete with campaign bands and entertainers. Though the whole concept of government by public servants was an alien one, the Japanese people seemed to like the idea of freely choosing their own representatives in the government. And in a completely free election in the spring of 1946, nearly three quarters of the electorate went to the polls, including two thirds of the eligible women voters. Of the changes the occupation has made in the Japanese way of life, None has met with greater success than its land reform. Until the end of the war, nearly three quarters of Japan's farmers were merely tenants, paying their landlords from 50 to 70 percent of their annual crop. But at MacArthur's direction, the great estates were bought up by the government and resold to the farmers on liberal terms. A focal point in the democratization program. Was the Japanese school system, which was provided with newly revised textbooks, purged of militarism, and staffed with teachers of non nationalistic backgrounds. Japanese state universities, from most of which women were traditionally barred, were made co educational. But despite efforts for democratic reform, many young Japanese idealists and intellectuals turned toward communism. In its struggle for control of the Japanese mind, the Communist Party of Japan directed its propaganda not only to critics of occupation and government policies, but to anyone dissatisfied with his lot. Its strategists were able men, headed by Moscow trained party leader Sanzo Nozaka. Though the progress of communism in Japan has been comparatively slow, it still has a powerful appeal to the unemployed and to the impoverished masses. For the party's principal weapon in Japan was not ideology, but the promise of jobs and a full bowl of rice. Taking full advantage of the freedom allowed them under the new democracy, The communists at first held huge mass meetings. But strategist Nozaka felt that large scale national action might well result in a showdown with the occupation or the Japanese government, and that the aims of the party would be better served by harassing the country's economy with small but numerous strikes and demonstrations. The membership of Japan's Communist Party was enlarged little by little. With the arrival of each new shipload of Japanese prisoners of war sent back from the Soviet Union. 1,700,000 former Japanese, indoctrinated with communist dogma before being allowed to return home, were repatriated during the five years following the end of World War II.
While Japanese leaders hoped that no more than 20% of these would remain communists, even that number was a source of worry to the government, headed by Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida. The government's real problems in combating communism were economic. Always largely dependent upon other nations for their food, the Japanese, after the war, had to import one-fourth of what they ate from the United States. The Japanese fishing industry, which in pre-war days provided food for the home islands and for export as well, was slowly revived, though fishing areas were limited by allied agreement to the Northwest Pacific. Japan's 600 shipyards were put back in operation and were permitted unlimited construction for foreign customers, but vessels for domestic use were restricted in size and number. The raw silk and cotton textile industries, upon which Japanese export trade was once heavily dependent, were also back in production. But though the price of raw silk had been drastically reduced, the decided preference of U.S. women for nylon had virtually eliminated Japan's number one pre-war market for this commodity. Steel and other metals were scarce, but the Japanese automobile industry was again in high gear, turning out trucks at a rate of 2,500 per month to help bolster the country's domestic economy. At the Toyota Automobile Factory, as in other Japanese industrial plants, skilled workers like Takashi Saito considered themselves very well off to be earning as much as $30 a month. In accordance with Japan's new democratic ways, Saito and his fellow employees regularly attended union meetings to discuss their working conditions and to hear reports from their leaders. Though most of the workers at the Toyota factory lived in barracks provided by the company, Saito was lucky enough to have a home of his own, bought by the savings of his parents. Despite the food shortage, they usually managed to set a better table than most families, with enough rice or noodles and fish, and meal time for the Saitos became one of the happiest hours of the day. Takashi Saito's family is very small by Japanese standards. There are his wife, Kazue, their daughter, Chieko, and their young son, Yoshinobu. Living with the Saitos are Takashi's mother, Seiki, and his father, Matsutaro, who are well satisfied with their good fortune. Like all Japanese housewives, Kazue Saito has plenty of work to do to keep her family going. For though her husband's wages are above average, she must cut corners wherever she can to get by. On her daily visits to the market near her home, Kazue finds that food prices are still almost prohibitively high. But living in the country does have its advantages. At least fruits and vegetables are more plentiful than in the overcrowded cities. While Kazue does her errands, young Yoshinobu and his friends often play baseball, a sport which for a quarter of a century has been as much the national pastime of Japan as of the U.S. Like other Japanese women, Kazue Saito has become an avid follower of the day-to-day -day adventures of Blondie a comic strip which, in its portrayal of the lighter side of American family life, has become a symbol of democracy. At the end of his day's work and on his days off, when he likes to fish with his son, Takeshi Saito thinks of his own future and that of Japan. Under the occupation, the Christian religions of the Western world gained a greater freedom and a better opportunity to flourish 
than ever before in history, teaching by precept and example the ways of virtue, charity, and peace, they aided in the struggle to bring Western ideas of right and wrong to the Japanese people. But the ancient festivals of Shintoism were being revived once more. And it was the very existence of this religion which made it possible for the militarists to establish the perverted cult of state Shintoism, fostering the belief that all mankind must be brought under the rule of the emperor. And though Hirohito had publicly denied his divinity after years of being worshipped as a god, he still received the adulation of millions of his people. Under the leadership of General MacArthur, the vast social experiment in Japan made real progress. But even as he worked to indoctrinate the Japanese with democracy, there was unrelenting pressure from the communists. Resisting that pressure became increasingly important. For strategically located as Japan is in a world that is fast being turned into two armed camps, it was a vital matter to the free nations of the world that Japan become a working democracy. 